good confession. Do you know what year that was written, Aaron? Uh, I, I looked it up, 1500, mid-1500s. Okay. It was accepted officially in the early 1500s. All right, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Chapter 5. Yeah, actually, believe it or not, I was reading about the Heidelberg Confession the last couple of weeks. Um, Luther made a lot of comments about it, and from it uh, came up with what he called the theology of the cross, as opposed to the theology of glory, which actually we'll talk about in the final point this morning. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 11. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. But what we are is known to God, and I hope it is known also to your conscience. We are not commending ourselves to you again, but giving you cause to boast about us, so that you may be able to answer those who boast about outward appearance and not about what is in the heart. For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ controls us because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all that those who might live no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. Let's pray. Lord, we are so very thankful for your word. Uh, without it, we would be lost. Uh, without it, we would be sorely depressed. But we are thankful that we have it and that we are able to come together to preach it so that you might speak to us through your word and uh, to your people so that we might live lives that are faithful to you that we might be maturing in our faith for your glory and our good. In your name we pray, amen. Well, it may not appear on face value that Paul is being attacked here, but as we've already discovered as we look through 2 Corinthians is that Paul is enduring really a number of different attacks against his character and uh, he has to answer those. And the attack that is being leveled against him here in this paragraph that he must answer is that he is a self-serving, boasting individual. That at the end of the day, the reason that Paul is doing this ministry is because it's for his self-glory. And so he must answer these accusations. If he doesn't answer the accusations, it would appear that he is guilty. And if he answers these accusations, he runs the risk of being guilty of the very thing that he's being accused of, of boasting. And so he has to maneuver through this landmine of, of accusations and come out on the other side with a, a correct perspective, if you will. And so, um, as Paul is having to answer these accusa accusations that he is in the ministry for the sake of self-adulation, for self-boasting, he's having to uh, defend his integrity here. And um, so, in other words, we could say this at the outset, is that the reason that we do certain things for God is important. In other words, the Nike commercial, just do it, doesn't really apply to the Christian life. What is, why are we doing what we are doing is important to God. You'll say, wait, wait, wait a minute. Didn't Paul say in Philippians chapter 1 that there were people who were preaching the gospel, but they were preaching the gospel with selfish motives, hoping to agitate Paul, 
I think in this respect, because Paul was in prison at the time, and these individuals were preaching the gospel, hoping to get a, a number of individuals to follow them so that, that people would say, see, look at, look at us, look at how many people are following us. So it really didn't have anything to do with the gospel per se, per se but it had to do with uh, look at, at, at the following, the people that are following us. But you know, Paul, while he commends the fact that they are preaching the gospel, he does not condone the attitude by which they do it. In fact, in the very next chapter, Paul says, do nothing from empty and vain deceit. So the reason why we do ministry, and we all do ministry, uh, why we do it is important to God. It isn't just do it. Why are we doing what we are doing? And, and, and we should do it. We should minister, not be like Moses who said, get somebody else. And so there are four things that Paul says here as to the reason why he is ministering. And I don't think in any particular order, as one is necessarily maybe important, but all four need to be taken together. He starts out in verse 11, he says, Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, reason number one, because of the fear of the Lord, that is the reason why I am doing what I'm doing. Now, you've been Christians long enough. Most of you here, you know that fear of the Lord here doesn't mean that he's shivering in his boots. Now, I think most of you are well aware of the fact that when it says fear of the Lord, it means that we have a respect for God. Uh, but we have to balance this with the fact that we are to delight in God. Psalm 37, 4. Delight thyself in the Lord and he'll give you the desires of your heart. The Apostle Paul reminds us in the book of Philippians that we are to rejoice always in the Lord. How can we rejoice in the Lord if, if we aren't delighting in him? And so on the one hand, God wants us to delight in him, but on the other hand, we are to have a healthy respect of God. So let me just give you an illustration. Hopefully this helps to understand these two concepts that we must hold in tension in concerning our God and not go one side, uh, from one side too much to the other. Um, uh, the Grand Canyon, I've mentioned this a number of times. I guess I use it as an illustration because I was so impressed when I saw it. I couldn't imagine that there could be that big of a hole in the earth, but there is. And, uh, and pictures do it. No, pictures just don't do it justice. Uh, you have to see it in person to really get an impression of just how magnificent it is. And of course, it is a national park, and it was made a national park in part so that we, people of the United States and around the world, might go to the Grand Canyon and enjoy it. Uh, you can go there and you can enjoy it from your car if you don't want to walk around just by looking. You can get out, take pictures of it. You can rent a helicopter and you can fly around it. You can rent a, a donkey and walk down it. I've always been a bit afraid of doing that for fear that my donkey's going to have a heart attack on the way down. But... Um, you could walk down into the Grand Canyon. You can camp in the Grand Canyon. You can take a raft down the Grand Canyon. Um, there are many things that you can do in the Grand Canyon to enjoy the Grand Canyon. But the Grand Canyon also has a number of things that are dangerous. And so you have to be respectful of the Grand Canyon or it could kill you. If you get too close to the edge and you fall off, if you're riding on a donkey and it has a heart attack, you could die. Um, and so there needs to be a respect there, you see. And in the same way, God wants us to enjoy him. He wants us to enjoy the fact that he is faithful, that he is loving, that he's omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient, and so forth and so on. God wants us to delight in who he is, and yet at the same time, we must respect who God is as well. As the scriptures tell us, he is a consuming fire in the book of Hebrews. Now, we as Christians do not have to fear eternal 
consequences because of the shed blood of Christ on our behalf, but nevertheless, out of fear of our Lord, we need to take him seriously and what he has said that we should do. You know, I think that too many times we as Christians forget that. In fact, J.I. Packard has just written a book about it. Taking God seriously. Now, I listened to his interview and he says, you know, this trouble with our world today is that even Christians don't take God seriously. It's interesting. But Paul takes God seriously, knowing the fear of the Lord. He starts out by saying in verse 11, therefore, which ties us back to what he had just said in verse 10, knowing that we must all appear before the Bema seat of Christ, therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord. As I've said before, salvation is an absolutely free gift. Because of Christ's imputed righteousness to us, we stand before God guiltless. We have been justified. So salvation is an absolutely free gift, but discipleship is a costly thing. God has given us a stewardship, as we shall see next week. We have been made ambassadors for Jesus Christ. He has given us a stewardship, and he expects us to be faithful in that stewardship. <clears throat> and he rewards, or lack thereof, in light of it. Jesus talked about this in Matthew 25, where he talks about different individuals been given a stewardship. Some have been given ten, some five, another person one. And uh, so that the master gave them a, a stewardship, and the master comes back, and the first one said, See, Lord, you gave me ten, and I have multiplied it. And the master says, Good for you. The next one says, I, you gave me five and I multiplied it. And the master says, good for you. The final one says, you gave me one and I did nothing with it because I was afraid of you. And Jesus said, I'm taking it away and throwing you into the pit because number one is that you had a wrong perspective of me. Uh, I am not somebody uh, terrible to work for. But the point here, the last person I don't believe was saved, but the point here is simply this, is that God does reward those who are faithful stewards of what God has given to us. And God has given each and every one of us spiritual gifts, and he expects us to use it in the service of one another and beyond our community. And someday we have to give an account for that. That's what Paul is saying. You know, I'm, I'm sure that there were days when Paul says, you know, I've had enough. I've had enough of doing this. After all, when you read his autobiography in chapter 11, you're thinking to yourself, if I were Paul, I would have given up a whole long time ago. Or as somebody has once said, when he was in prison and he and Silas or Barnabas, they were singing praises, somebody has said, well, if I had been with Paul, Paul would have been singing a solo by himself. See that? And I'm sure that there were days when Paul thought to himself, you know, why, why should I keep on keeping on for fear of the Lord? Because one day we have to give an account of what God has given to us. What have you done with it? Have you been faithful with it? Have you used the gifts that I have given you to serve other people? Or have you just been your own selfish pig? You know? Take it seriously. We must all appear before the Bema Seat of Christ to give an account of what we have done. Have we been faithful? The second reason that Paul gives for why he is doing what he is doing is because of a love for people. He says, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. Here he is not thinking of persuading others to believe in the gospel what he, is, what he is doing here is he's saying, I am, I, I am trying to persuade you Corinthians to know that the reason that I am ministering to you is because I love you. Now, there are others, the false teachers, 
who minister to people to try to gain a crowd so that they might boast about the numbers. You know, by the way, we pastors are terribly guilty of that. Terribly guilty of that. When pastors get together, invariably it always comes up, how big is your church? Who cares? It's God's church. Um, But anyway, but Paul says, what I'm trying to persuade you of is that I am not ministering to you so that I might be able to impress other people about how many people are following me. I am trying to persuade you that I love you so that we boast not about outward appearances but what is in the heart. And and, and Paul would go on to say, so that you might boast about me because I love you. So once again, it's not really about Paul. The reason I'm trying to persuade you that I love you is that you might see, hey, Paul really loves us. That's what Paul is wanting to do here with the Corinthians, you see. I'm not not ministering for selfish reasons. I'm not ministering so that I might have this big crowd so everybody might ooh and ah. My real heart is about you. You know, it makes me think of what Paul says in the book of Colossians, where Paul says, I rejoice in my suffering for your sake, and I make the word of God fully known so that you might be raised to maturity in Jesus Christ. That's my desire. I want to see you grow in Christ. It's not about me. And, uh, it, you know, it, 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 it makes me think of parents. You know, every parent knows that There are trials and tribulations in uh, regards to your children and raising them up. Um, But you go through the trials and tribulations. Why? Well, most parents go through the trials and tribulations because they love their children. And they want to see them mature so that you hang in there and you keep ministering. You know, it would have been so, if Paul was in this just for himself... He would have said, uh, boo-hoo to the Corinthians, and I'm going to Troas where there's an open door of opportunity to minister. I'm going over there. Why should I stay here? The reason why is because when you love somebody, it's more than emotional. When you love somebody, you are faithful to hang in there during the tough times to help them to grow. You know, it really speaks to each and every one of us, does it not? is that we must be committed to one another. And that when we're in the body of Christ, you're going to discover that when you're ministering to other people, it doesn't always work out the way that you would like. Working with other people is a tough job. If you don't believe it, just ask Moses, who was about ready to be stoned on a number of different occasions. But if you love somebody, you stick it out and you help them. You help them to grow. And that's what Paul is doing here. What a wonderful man. What a loving man. Um, Again, I think many times the accusation against Paul is that he is this type A individual that could care less about individuals, that he's always caring about numbers, and it's just the very opposite of what the apostle is saying here. I care about individuals, not about the numbers gain. The third reason why Paul is doing what he is doing is because of the love of Christ. The love of Christ has made him crazy. That's how his detractors view it. Um, Paul, in the next paragraph, which we'll see next week, he says, at one time I knew Jesus Christ according to the flesh, and that's all that I knew him by. You know, When people say, I don't believe that Jesus Christ ever existed, you know, they ought to stop and think about Paul. Paul at one time despised Jesus Christ, hated him, but he could not deny that Jesus Christ really existed. He was in the flesh. But when he was on a Damascus road, Paul had this dramatic conversion as he saw the the risen Lord Jesus Christ. And in that moment, He now understands that Jesus is indeed the Messiah. And he repents in sackcloth and ashes. 
And then he begins to preach this great love that has now come to him. And uh, people are saying, you're crazy. You're crazy. You believe in a bodily resurrection? And Paul says, that's okay if people think I'm crazy because when I am teaching you, O Corinthians, I'm in my right mind. I'm teaching you the truth. You know, many of us could say the same thing. As I've shared with you a number of times, before I was saved, I was saved between my sophomore and junior in, in uh, high school and never went to church, and I came to understand that Jesus Christ was the Christ. And so all of my friends were into wine, women, and song as well. And so that when I came to understand the love of Jesus Christ for me, the first thing I wanted to do was go back and tell my friends and my family. And so that's what I did. I told them all. And there was only one of my friends that said, you're not out of your mind. All the rest said, you're crazy, man. All you believe that? I thought, well, surely, surely. It was so simple and easy for me. But without the Spirit of God, you just simply do not understand. But, you know, the interesting thing is people accused me of being out of my mind, and I thought to myself, I'm in now in my right mind. Prior to that, the world was upside, now it's, now it's right side up. As Josh McDowell would say, I haven't lost my mind, I have found it in accepting the Lord Jesus Christ. But the love of God compels me, says Paul, to to uh, continue to preach uh, this message. Because as God has loved me and as I understand that, I just have to reach out and love other people. Now, not every day do we feel that way. But there is that compulsion. If God loves me, I need to be loving other people. It makes me think of Hebrews chapter 10. Do not forsake the assembling together of one another, but come together to encourage one another to love and to good works. So for the love of Christ, that is why we minister. The fourth reason that he gives, and it's implied, and he's going to speak more about it next week, but it is the message that he loves. For the love of Christ controls us because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he, that is speaking about Christians. And he died for all, that those who might live should live no longer for themselves, but for him, for whose sake, for their sake, died and was raised. That they might live for him. Paul loved the gospel of Jesus Christ. As he would say in the book of Romans, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God unto salvation. But you know the gospel as Paul outlines it there in the book of Romans, actually goes from Romans chapter 1 through 11. The gospel unabridged, if you will. And the gospel has the power not only to save people, not only to save sinners, but to transform saints. And so Paul uh, is constantly preaching the extended gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, we believers need the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel isn't just for unbelievers. It's for believers as well. Let me see if I can demonstrate this. In the book of Galatians, uh, there is what is called the Galatian heir. This is what happened at the church at Galatia is that they had accepted Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. False teachers had come in and said, oh, that's okay, but now you need to perfect yourself by doing various things. In other words, it's this way, is that you were saved by faith, but you grow by keeping the law. Now, the law cannot help us grow in any way, shape, or form. The law can only tell us what we should do is does not help us to do it. But it's a subtle thing that works in the Christian life. Because when we look at the law initially, there is something within us that says, I think I can do it. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to do it. 
And uh, so I, I try to do it. And the reason why I want to try to keep the law is because I know at the end of the day I'll be further blessed. God will give me a better job. God will give me a better marriage. God will give me a better home, a better family, a better place to live if I can just be more compliant uh, to, to, to the law. And so at the end of the day, what really happens for many of us as Christians is that we are obeying God, hoping that he will give us the things of this world which are good. But at the end of the day, we simply cannot do it. Because at the end of the day, the good I want to do, I don't do. And so then we become frustrated because God doesn't give us what we think we should and have earned and deserved. It's sort of the James chapter where it says you do not have because you do not ask. And then when you do ask, you ask for selfish motives. Therefore, you do not receive. And so you see, this is why we need... So in other words, the law appeals to our flesh. And when we succeed, what we think in keeping the law, we boast, about, we, we boast in our hearts. See, look at what I have done. And so every day we must be brought to the cross to be reminded that we are wretched sinners and there is nothing that we can do apart from the grace and the mercy of God. Our sinful nature only responds to the cross of Christ. That's why in Romans chapter 6, Paul brings us back to the cross. Those who have died with Christ have been set free from sin. And so every day we must be brought low once again. We are wretched sinners. We cannot please God in ourself. And so we must appropriate God's grace and mercy and love again and again and again. So that the reward is not the things of this world, the reward is the presence of Christ in our lives. That's why we need constantly the gospel over and over and over again as Christians. We need it because the gospel reminds us that we're sinners. We must appropriate God's grace and Jesus Christ is our reward. Not a better life in this world. That's not a popular message in church today, but it is. The gospel that Paul loved to preach. And by the way, that's what Luther picked up in the Heidelberger Confession, is the gospel of suffering as opposed to the gospel of glory. The gospel of glory appeals to the flesh. Look at what I have done. The gospel of suffering appeals to what Christ has done on our behalf. And he is our reward. It matters, brothers and sisters. First of all, hopefully, we're convinced that we must use what God has given us to minister to one another. There's no question about that. Though we're all tempted, like Moses, why don't you get somebody else who've had enough of this? This is tough work, difficult work. I just want to be my own little cocoon. We can't do it. God wants us to minister. But we must minister with the right attitude. Out of fear of God, out of the love of God, out of a love for people and a belief that the message that we are teaching and communicating to one another and beyond has the power to transform lives. As Paul would say, do nothing from empty and vain conceit, but do all things for the glory of God. And it comes back to bless us as well. Let's pray.